The American Law Institute is producing an audiovisual history of persons who are active in its affairs over the years. Today, we shall be interviewing Professor Herbert Wexler. Professor Wexler was elected to the American Law Institute in March of 1954 and became a life member in June of 1980. Before his election to membership, he served as reporter starting in 1952 for the Model Penal Code, a project that was completed in 1962. Following his reportership, Professor Wexler was designated director of the American Law Institute in 1963, a position that he held until 1984. Upon his retirement in that year, Professor Wexler became director emeritus and was elected as a member of the council. Our interview today is taking place in Professor Wexler's residence in New York City, the date being April 13th, 1989. I first asked Professor Wexler what his earliest recollection of the American Law Institute was, perhaps as a law student or later on as a law clerk. Uh, papers about a uh, symposium that I recall it was published a lifetime ago by uh, West Publishing Company, I think, in a uh, magazine that the period was put out by the Association of American Law Schools. But uh, at that point, uh, the whole idea uh, captured my interest. But that continued? As far as it were, I, uh... Well, I'm talking about uh, my first years as a teacher, really, which started in 1931. Didn't they use the restatement of law school in those days when you were a student? I think uh, my recollection is that in both contracts and in torts, the instructors uh, did, quite naturally, because the instructor in torts was Professor Bolin, who was the first reporter for the restatement of torts. In contracts, my teacher was Professor Oliphant, Herman Oliphant, who was, I think, uh, one of the most effective critics of the whole idea of a restatement, and that was instructive, too. Was that a subject of debate? between the students and the professor as to whether the restatement was worth the candle? Well, not really, I'd say. Uh, uh, Oliphant, you know, was what we called in those days a rule skeptic. So anything that attempted to put anything in black letter invited his uh, ridicule and hostility. But there's still people like that. I was just looking the other day at Friedman's History of American Law, which he has some very unkind things to say about the Institute. Yes, I think I remember coming across... Uh, I didn't think that was particularly compelling, but uh, I guess I have, pretty, I have a pretty good collection of criticisms of the Institute. Some of them have been very good. You remember the Goodrich article with Thurman Arnold, I think, was in the Yale yeah. Law Journal? Institute the debate, you mean. The debate, yeah, about the Institute. Well, the, the thing that I wondered about was how come you didn't become a member before you became a reporter? Modesty. Now, that still obtains today, people. The people you're one or two modest to become, ask to become members. We lose a lot of people in the Institute, I think, because we proceed on the assumption that uh, since they're uh, bright or otherwise able or distinguished, they must necessarily be members. Well, uh, very frequently they're not, and the reason why they're not is that nobody has ever occurred to anybody to ask them, or everybody assumed that they were members. I remember it took quite a lot of uh, courage on my part after I'd been a reporter for a couple of years 
to ask Judge Goodrich if he'd propose me, uh, get me proposed as a member. And he looked at me with astonishment and said, you mean you're not a member? And I, how about you? Well, I, I waited until I think uh, John Buchanan raised the point why I wasn't a member. And, and he asked and me... You didn't come forward either no. and propose yourself or put yourself forward. Uh, I think John Buchanan was the instrument of my becoming a member. Well, I, I think uh, your career as a director is unique. I, if I'm correct, you're the only one that was a reporter, director, and now a council member. Goodrich died in office and Lewis uh, I think he may have become an I don't think he was ever a reporter I mean you're wrong yes uh, there was one project uh, that he uh, if you check back you'll find that he took on and it's interesting in relation to our present problems uh, there was a period when early in the game uh, when the Institute wanted to do something in the field of business associations. And uh, during the uh, preliminary period, uh, Mr. Lo Dr. Lewis uh, served as a reporter, and you'll find in the files that there are a few tentative drafts that uh, he prepared. Uh, he, he was assisted by a professor at Penn, uh, whom I knew very well, uh, Alexander Fry. Uh, and whether uh, the drafting was actually done by Fry and blessed by Lewis, uh, or actually done by Lewis, of course, I don't know. But uh, our, pr our printed proceedings uh, indicate the proceedings on those drafts, which are not without interest, a little bit fanatic, I thought, when I went through them. Anyhow, the, as you know, the uh, project was abortive, and uh, it's not entirely clear to me why, in the end, it, uh, it collapsed, but uh, Maybe there was a business roundtable in those days also. No, uh, as far as I know, there was no uh, denunciation of it comparable to the stupidity that emerges from the business roundtable today. Well, I, and I, I suppose though Lewis was a, I have to check this, was a, made an emeritus member of the council for the brief period of time he had after he sat down as director in uh, 47. Who will you find? Pardon me? Lewis. Uh, no, but who will you find who is on deck then? Well, I can look in the uh, records yeah, and check to see if that was, uh, yeah, just to see whether you are as unique as I thought you were. Since we lost John Buchanan, uh, our living memories uh, don't really go back well, behind the time when I became a reporter. Well, there are two people that have volunteered. Uh, Jim Kasner, oh, yes. who was a reporter way back, Yeah. and I ran into Milton Handler, and he remembers being a, an advisor. Yeah. Now, he's, incidentally, Handler is a good illustration of what we're talking about. I don't believe that he's a member of the Institute, and I think that if you ask him why he isn't, he'd say that nobody ever invited him. I'll have to check that. Well, let's go to uh, the decade of your reportership. Uh, why the special interest in criminal law, penal law? Well, that's an interesting question to, to put. I started uh, teaching, you know, in, in 1931, uh, right after I graduated from Columbia, uh, at which time my assignment was to work up a course in federal jurisdiction. We didn't have one in the school then. There had been one uh, years before uh, taught by Harold Medina. Uh, but uh, when uh, uh, 
Medina stopped teaching it for some reason. He continued teaching New York practice at Columbia uh, for quite some years, uh, but he didn't continue teaching federal jurisdiction. I never found out uh, why, but it was a hole in the curriculum. And so my first year it was devoted to uh, working up a course in federal jurisdiction. I didn't like Medina's book, but uh, happily Felix Frankfurter came out with a book that year, and I was able to use that, which was somewhat better. Uh, but then I went to Washington, and I was out for a year as law clerk to Justice Stone, and I came back as an assistant professor in 1933 and a member of the faculty. Uh, uh, when I came back, it was with the idea of devoting my life to teaching, and the plan that they had for me was to participate with Jerome Michael in filling another gap in the Columbia curriculum at that time. There was no course in criminal law. That, uh, that, that hiatus uh, tells you something about uh, the law school and probably about the law schools of the early 1930s. There wasn't any money in criminal law, uh, and uh, therefore it wasn't included in the curriculum. Uh, well, my father had been a lawyer, was then a lawyer, uh, and uh, during a long career at the bar, he had practiced quite a lot of criminal law. Indeed, the most interesting cases that he had uh, were criminal cases. His partner was a very good trial lawyer and did the trial work, and my father did the appellate work. Uh, and so uh, long before I went to law school, I found myself reading his briefs in the New York Court of Appeals, and naturally, uh, when I went to law school, I uh, had no pleasanter occupation than looking up the reports of the uh, decisions in the cases of, uh, that uh, he had had. Well, as I said, many of them were criminal cases, and some of them quite interesting criminal cases. And uh, so given the inherent uh, dramatic uh, uh, quality of the subject and that special family interest, uh, I found that uh, during my period as a, as a student, uh, I developed a uh, uh, quite substantial interest in criminal law, uh, and uh, I was delighted for that reason when I got the assignment of uh, work to work with Jerome Michael in developing a course in criminal law. Michael was then engaged in uh, some great project of the time, and the consequence was that it fell to me for the first years or so to get the uh, criminal law work off the ground. And I started putting together a, uh, a set of materials, which uh, in the end we worked on for some seven or eight years before they were first published in 1940, I think, uh, under the title of Criminal Law and Its Administration, which a book that uh, made a real contribution, I think, by going outside the cases and the statutes and attempting to uh, bring to bear on criminal law teaching uh, the criminological uh, social science aspects of the subject. 
And uh, it's always had been, was then, and ever since has been one of my major interests. Well, how, how did the, or under what circumstances did the penal code or codification of the criminal law of body institute originate? Well, I'll tell you, that has an interesting background. Uh, I'll go all the way back. Uh, in the, uh, in the formative days when the institute was originally being organized in the early 20s, uh, one of the enthusiastic leaders of the movement uh, was Governor Hadley of Missouri, and his idea was that the major work of the institute should be in the field of criminal law uh, because of the uh, uh, enormous social and political importance of the subject and the fact that it was not getting any sustained uh, thoughtful attention anywhere. Uh, and in the beginning, uh, there was uh, a serious consideration of uh, what the Institute should do in criminal law. They soon discovered that a restatement approach uh, was not going to be easy to work out because the subject was so predominantly statutory. And uh, there was, in, in the 30s, there was a council meeting at which Judge Learned Hand uh, maintained heroically that uh, if you were thoughtful about it, uh, the fact that it was statutory uh, should help rather than hinder the effort. But uh, his colleagues were unpersuaded, and uh, in the end, the project was dropped in favor of doing the model code of criminal procedure. Uh, somehow or other, it was felt, and, and properly so, I guess, that there was more uniformity and uh, articulatable pattern in the prevailing criminal procedure than there was in the prevailing substantive law. Uh, but still, uh, they came up with the idea of doing a model code, and as you know, they, that's one of your publications, uh, and it had a great influence in the 1930s on the uh, then existing uh, procedural uh, statutes uh, throughout the, uh, the country. Uh, well, there then, uh, uh, in the 30s, it then developed within the Institute a uh, strong program uh, to do the same thing with substantive criminal law. And there was a committee of the Institute that uh, filed a report uh, recommending uh, that a model code of criminal law uh, be drafted. The trouble was, though, that the committee that uh, came forward with this uh, recommendation, uh, had the most elaborate ideas as to the procedure to be followed. Uh, their plan called for enormous uh, empirical studies of the actual administration of the uh, criminal law, uh, which they thought somehow uh, would be the proper basis for uh, statutory uh, formulations in a model uh, code. Uh, Justin Miller, a pedagogue of that time, uh, who I think later became a judge, uh, was, I believe, the chairman of that, uh, of that committee. Anyhow, 
the uh, an estimate of the financial needs of such an undertaking uh, were quite gargantuan for the time. And of course, what happened was that this was uh, being talked about and being pushed uh, just as the market crashed in 1929 and the Depression followed. And of all the Institute uh, ambitions, uh, this was the first one to be discarded uh, because it was the most expensive one to, uh, uh, to realize. Actually, uh, however, it was that uh, bit of experience that Judge Goodrich picked up uh, uh, later on in the, uh, what, the early 1950s, I guess, uh, in when he was thinking about the program of the Institute. And uh, that made him wonder whether there wasn't some way to go about uh, uh, working in the in the criminal law, and uh, uh, he came to me, uh, I guess among others, uh, for advice on that subject. I knew him casually from the law school meetings uh, from the time when he was dean. Before he became judge, I uh, got to know him a little bit after he became a judge. When I was during the period when I was assistant attorney general, and uh, of course concerned with at times with cases in the Third Circuit. But uh, out of that grew the memoranda that I wrote. Uh, and that he liked uh, the material that's published in the Harvard Law Review under the title of the challenge of a model penal code. But these were actually two. This, what's in the Harvard Law Review is actually, in substance, uh, two memoranda that I wrote for the Institute. Uh, the first of which was read at an annual meeting of the Institute in, oh, what would it have been, uh, 1950 maybe, around there, 51, the period for which we have no published records at the, uh, at the uh, moment. And, uh, those memoranda uh, had the approval of a quite interesting and eclectic advisory committee uh, that uh, Judge Goodrich established and really were the basis on which the Rockefeller Foundation ultimately made the grants totaling before we were done a half a million dollars uh, on with which the model penal code was drafted. Who had acts who thought of the Rockefeller? Was that Tim Pfeiffer? Or no. Uh, no, no. No, it was through Judge Goodrich. Uh, Dr. Joseph Willits, I think was his name. I taught at Penn at one time. Huh? He taught at Penn, I think, at one time. He'd been the dean of the Warden School uh, at Penn. And uh, he became the, uh, somewhere around that time, he became the uh, director of what was called the Social Science Division of Rockefeller Foundation. Uh, Judge Goodrich had been discussing with him uh, whether the Institute could not uh, do something useful in the field of criminal law, and whether the Foundation might be interested in uh, providing funds if some plan could be worked out. So the way that, the way that developed was that the uh, Rockefeller Foundation, at uh, Goodrich's request, uh, made a small grant on uh, ten or $15,000. Uh, for the instance.
to to, pers to pursue the idea uh, somewhat further, and then Goodrich, I think he went first to Louis Schwartz, who developed a memorandum uh, arguing that this would be a useful thing to do, and uh, then Judge Goodrich, along with Tweed and Tim Pfeiffer, uh, who was a partner of Tweed's in the, uh, in the law firm, uh, and had served uh, on and off uh, as outside counsel to the Rockefeller Foundation. Uh, he was indeed uh, one of the lawyers for the Rockefeller family. But these three people, uh, Goodrich, Tweed, and Pfeiffer, uh, had the main interest in this. And uh, I was uh, retained to advise on the development of a study group and also to provide the materials that the study group would examine. Uh, well, we did develop quite an interesting study group uh, of academics and practitioners, uh, including prosecutors. Uh, we had, for example, uh, Frank Hogan's chief assistant from the uh, New York uh, area in the New York District Attorney's uh, Office. We had uh, a couple of state attorneys general uh, on, this, uh, on this group. Uh, we had the principal academics uh, working in the field of criminal law. Uh, we had uh, representation from uh, uh, the branch of psychiatry that concerns itself with criminal behavior in one of the ablest of those people, uh, Dr. Manfred Guttmacher uh, of um, Baltimore. Uh, we had uh, uh, people engaged in penological work, uh, Jim Bennett, who was then the director of the Federal Bureau of Prisons, uh, for example, Sanford Bates, who'd been his predecessor in that, uh, in that field, uh, we had the California people uh, who had been uh, uh, somewhat adventuresome in dealing with correctional matters. Well, uh, we must have had uh, three or four meetings of this, of this group uh, in the course of which uh, Sheldon Glick of Harvard uh, filed a, a, a memorandum uh, taking a uh, different view of the uh, purposes of criminal law, a much more clinical view. Uh, the group voted down Glick's approach and sustained mine. Uh, and approved the memoranda. Then we went back to the Rockefeller Foundation with the memoranda and the support of the committee and a proposed budget for the project. And uh, much to our delight and surprise, uh, they came along with a grant of $250,000, which was to uh, sustain a $50,000 a year budget for five years, and with the understanding that the matter would be re-examined at the end of five years if uh, the work seemed to be successful. Well, it was re-examined, and we, our estimate was that we needed another five years to get finished. Uh, so we got another uh, grant in the same amount, and after 10 years, uh, we did get done. On the button. How long did that study take before, it, before the, for, that led to the grant? You said the group met four or five times? Yes. Did that take about a year? Or? 
Yes, we worked all along, I think, about 14, 15 months, all told. And I, I take it that many of the individuals in that study group ultimately became your advisors. Yes, sure. And was Paul Tappan in that study group, or did he come on the scene later? No, he was in the study group. So, well, uh, and who suggested that you should be the chief reporter? Oh. Well, uh, I think in all candor that when I was asked to do the preparatory work, leading to the grant, and when we got the grant, uh, it, it seemed uh, natural that uh, I should be, certainly be included in the group that would undertake to do what I said I thought was possible. Uh, and I think maybe even natural that I to be asked to take the chief uh, re re reporter's uh, responsibility. But if you ask who, who uh, proposed it, um, it must have been uh, Judge Goodrich and Mr. Tweed who proposed it to the council and the council that uh, approved it. How did you find the institute process of advisory committee meetings, uh, council meetings, and annual meetings worked out in developing the code. Was that a congenial yes, process? Yes, I, I thought it was a perfect medium to work, provided that the reporter uh, used it properly and, uh, and produced. It, it would uh, fall flat on its face uh, if the reporter uh, for a particular subject uh, was either so uh, uh, idiosyncratic that he kept laying before the group material that the group uh, turned down uh, or wasn't led to support. Uh, and uh, obviously, if he didn't produce, the, uh, then, then there'd be nothing for the uh, three organs, uh, advisory committee, uh, council, and membership uh, to consider. It's an onerous process because once you undertake it, uh, you've got to meet these deadlines. While a little tolerance maybe can be worked into the uh, into the scheduling, if you have enough projects going, uh, there's not much scope, and uh, it, it won't surprise you that we've had reporters who were unable somehow to develop anything to report. Well, you raise an interesting question of the <clears throat> accommodation between the views of a reporter and, let's say, the advisors or particularly the counsel. Uh, it, to what extent does a reporter have to adjust his personal views in order to accommodate the counsel? Or, or is this something that is it a scholarship or intellectual level that works itself out with a well, uh, I, I would say, first of all, uh, perhaps this is the most important point, uh, that the uh, council, uh, through all my years, has uh, seemed to me to be uh, a very sensible body that understood uh, that the kind of work that we do, uh, the creative element must, for the most part, uh, come from the reportorial uh, side of the uh, picture. And the council uh, functions best as a critical body. If the council had to originate, uh, I don't believe that, as a group, 
I don't believe it could do it. But given a text that's put before it for critique, uh, naturally, the uh, critical faculties of the legal profession uh, are brought into play in the very best best way. It's uh, we've, we've had reasonably good luck, I think, uh, in our projects and uh, uh, having reporters who understood how to deal with criticism, welcome criticism rather than resenting it, uh, and knew how to profit from it and a council that uh, didn't undertake, had no desire to supplant the reporter in originating the uh, material that should go forward. On rare occasions when that, that type of relationship has broken down, uh, it's ended up with, uh, really, with an impasse at which it was necessary to get rid of the reporter. Well, there have been some sort of release valves that I thought, I've always thought the notion of a study draft or a discussion draft was a kind of release valve that uh, sort of saves the day for the reporter and also saves the views of the council. Is that your view of those, that device? Well, it might serve that purpose, but that's not my view, view of the... Uh function of a study draft. I think study drafts should be used at a time when uh, both the reporter and the counsel uh, are sufficiently uncertain of the uh, direction to follow, uh, the options to be picked up, uh, the alternatives to be adopted uh, in working in a particular subject. Uh, that they uh, uh, welcome a wider uh, sounding board than the, even the advisors and the council can provide. I, I, I suppose there's another function too that when when, when the council and or the reporter uh, are really uncertain and want, want to buy time that a study draft is a good device and it, it keeps the matter on the agenda without uh, forcing a decision. Uh, and so it goes over for another year uh, during which, uh, hopefully, uh, a, uh, a consensus can be developed as to whether to move the material on to a tentative draft or to be considered for approval, or to drop it. Well, suppose you have a reporter who feels strongly enough about the subject. If he'll go with a study draft or a discussion draft, but he comes back to his original positions. Is that a question of his leaving the project at that point? Well, it might be, and at that point, uh, you're right that the study draft offers an opportunity to make a deal. Uh, the council says, we're not ready to go along with you, but uh, your ideas are interesting, and uh, uh, we don't object to your putting them out, and we'll publish them and then they're published as a study draft. And that happened, you know, with the tax material uh, on two occasions. And at least on one of those occasions, the ultimate result was the enactment of the ideas of the study draft. That was on the, uh, on the uh, combination of the estate and gift taxes, uh, federal estate and gift taxes. And I think I'm right that the same thing is happening in taxation uh, with respect to the corporate income tax. It's 
precarious position now where uh, uh, the, uh, if the corporation chooses uh, to finance itself uh, through equity, uh, through selling stock, uh, then the dividends distributed to shareholders uh, constitute taxable income to the shareholders, having previously, of course, uh, been derived from uh, income to the corporation that was taxable to the corporation. So you have double taxation in the, with respect to the uh, money involved in the dividend distributions. But if the, uh, if the corporation uh, chooses to finance itself uh, through uh, uh, borrowing rather than through equity financing, bonds, for example, uh, then interest paid on the bonds uh, is a deductible expense to the corporation. Uh, this is, of course, the reason for the junk bond uh, uh, epidemic of our time. I guess uh, Andrews is kind of prudent in agreeing to a discussion draft with the president, even though it, there wasn't a great receptivity to his proposals in that area, subchapter C, as I recall, with the council. Well, I think the council thought it premature to make the choice. Uh, it wasn't really hostility on the part of the council. And I think if you poll at the council that had to vote, I think they'd have voted to do away with double, uh, with the double taxation. Uh, well, getting back to the penal code, uh, what do you consider your greatest satisfaction in that project? In what areas, in particular areas, are your greatest disappointments? Well, uh, it had both. It has had, in retrospect, uh, both uh, uh, disappointments and uh, uh, gratifying uh, re results. From my point of view, I think that developing an acceptable general part for the code. Uh, that is to say, an acceptable formulation of the general principles that cut across uh, criminal law, such, for example, as the uh, uh, concept of criminal intent. This was, I think, on the one hand, the most difficult and creative uh, part of the uh, code work, and also the most successful, uh, because uh, uh, we, we've had uh, more utilization of this analysis of uh, mains rea, for example, and then we have, have any other single feature of the code uh, that was brought out at the Rutgers uh, conference, you may remember. And uh, even, even in jurisdictions where the legislatures have not uh, taken this on, uh, the courts have utilized it. They've utilized it in the way that we might utilize, that courts utilize a restatement and, uh, and, 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 and really developed it as a gloss on whatever uh, body of law the particular jurisdiction uh, may have. Uh, we were extremely gratified that our policy conceptions 
in highly controversial areas like sex offenses, for example, uh, proved, uh, to our surprise, I may say, proved uh, to be acceptable uh, legislatively. Uh, the, uh, for example, to take an easy case, of the decriminalization of adultery, The treatment of uh, uh, sexual relations uh, outside of wedlock between consenting, consenting adults uh, of the same sex even capital punishment though the Institute took no position on it, the comments indicated, the, uh, the uh, reporters and the advisors uh, were almost unanimously opposed uh, to the employment of capital punishment. Uh, that's perhaps a uh, victory that we're in the process of losing after 20 or 25 years of uh, crime, of increasing crime, though I expect that the states that have held out against the reinstatement of capital punishment uh, will, for the most part, uh, continue to hold out. Uh, the, the, the area in which uh, the developments of the last 25 years have uh, benefited least from the code uh, positions, I would say, is a very important area of sentencing. Uh, at the time when we were doing the code, the uh, dominant view in uh, certainly in academic circles, uh, in liberal circles, uh, even in many political circles, uh, uh, called for uh, a, uh, a, a, a thorough individualization of punishment with uh, great emphasis on the uh, character of the offender as distinguished from the nature of the offense uh, with discretion in the courts, uh, uh, in applying a wide range of sanctions, and also in the correctional agencies, particularly the uh, parole, a parole board, to uh, uh, determine the uh, uh, termination uh, of imprisonment. As you know, uh, uh, much to uh, everyone's surprise, the left wing and the right wing combined uh, some uh, a decade or so ago uh, to uh, oppose individualization and to uh, go back to determining sanctions by the nature and circumstances of the offense and what were deemed to be the just deserts uh, for the offender. I, I, I consider that a lamentable uh, retrogression, uh, which has led to an almost mechanical uh, approach to sentencing uh, by the application of uh, enormously detailed guidelines 
and I'm frank to say that I anticipate that the current developments will in due course collapse in their own way. Did you want to take a rest now, or shall we continue? What time is it? It's only 12.25. I'm... Well, I'm ready. I'm ready to go. Well, I thought we'd have lunch. We would have lunch here. Oh, we we'll would probably go on. But Good. if you're hungry... No, I'm not. I just don't want to wear you out. No. You're doing very well. You seem to be all right so far. Well, let's go into the... Uh... Oh, one more question. Were there any particular individuals in, in the 10 years of the model penal code that stood out? For their contributions or uh, their lack of contribution or made the, the lead, le left an impression on you in, in the process? Well, uh, yes, of course it was. Uh, overall, I think the most helpful uh, single advisor uh, that we had uh, was Judge Brightell of New York, Charles Brightell, who, when we started out, I think was still a justice of our appellate division here, but uh, in due course became an associate uh, judge of the Court of Appeals and then chief judge of, the, uh, of our highest court, the New York Court of Appeals. He had been uh, governor's counsel when Tom Dewey was governor of New York. And prior to that time, he had been a prosecutor uh, with Tom Dewey uh, in the uh, way back in the 30s when uh, Dewey's success as a prosecutor uh, brought him into national uh, prominence. Superb lawyer and a uh, uh, fine judge, and uh, he saw the possibilities of uh, an enterprise like the Model Penal Code, uh, and uh, he had marvelous judgment as to when formulations or articulations would be helpful and when they would not. Well, well there are others. I, I of course, <laughs> it's, it's all, you single out one person, you always uh, are in danger of doing an injustice uh, to others. But I'd say we had a, an exceedingly helpful advisory committee, and I was very lucky in having Lou Schwartz and Paul Tappan uh, as co-reporters. Uh, Tappan really was the uh, creator of the code's approach to sentencing. And uh, Schwartz, as you know, uh, did all the work on the definition of specific crime except homicide. Uh, I did homicide because I had written on, the, uh, on, on homicide and uh, perhaps knew the materials closer at hand than he did. Well, let's move on to the years as director. Uh, well, I think we ought to get in something about the effect of the code. Oh, sure. Why don't we take a break now? And we'll, that'll be a good place to pick up. Well, uh, I think it's recording. I hope the volume is held up. Has the binding held up, held up on it? Oh, sure. We had quite a to-do getting it done. Was it done in-house? No, we, we had a binder we sent it to, and there were some problems at first, but then it came through, and that's the presentation on at your at the dinner there. Well, Herb, we're now going to take up the uh, years of your being director.
quite a period. It's 20, at least 22 years, 22 reports anyway. Was there much difficulty in getting you to agree to be director? No. Wasn't a hard decision to reach? No, I, I, uh, I must confess when the judge died, I thought that this, you know, that it might, might be a uh, possibility that might come my way, but uh, I still was uh, sort of surprised. My, my own situation at that time, was, uh, so you were talking about, uh... Oh, 1963. Yeah. Well, you see that book up there, The Federal Courts? Yes. Which is now in the third edition. Uh, at that time, I, I was, uh, really just putting that thing to bed. So I, but well, we're not talking about 53, no, I'm not about that. 63, we're talking about. 63, no. Yeah, Goodrich died in 62. No, I know, I know what it was. It was the New York Times case. Solomon versus? Yeah. Solomon case. Solomon case. About which you just had a recent symposium. That's right. Uh, th that, uh, uh, when I was approached, I had just been retained by the New York Times to do the case in the Supreme Court. Certiorari had been granted, and uh, from my, my perspective, there was quite a lot of money in it for me, and so I had to say yes, but uh, I'd be delayed in taking on. And uh, the delay was getting the brief done in that case. Oh, you came in at an interesting time, I think, because I read your 1963 report. Uh, the Division of Jurisdiction was uh, starting up, I think, at the time, and uh, torts second uh, was winding up on intentional torts and negligence and at, at just about the time the permanent editorial board was being established uh, and you graciously uh, went against the agreement with the commissioners and let Bill Schneider serve as chairman and the foreign relations law we thought was being completed I think you in your report you said it was being edited right. And uh, pending was some possible new work uh, that had been explored, land use or land development, pre-arraignment, and federal, state, and gift tax. Uh, so I recall you were instrumental in getting the grants for uh, land use and pre-arraignment. Yes, I think I was. Uh, 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 but Judge Goodrich, I think, had gotten the process started. The important point, from a historical point of view, though, is that the decision that the Institute should work in those fields had been taken uh, by the Council, and I guess on the judge's recommendation, uh, before I, I uh, came on. So, in other words, when the judge died, the situation was that the penal code, from his point of view, had been completed. Uh, as you say, the Division of Jurisdiction project was still underway. I was an advisor, had been an advisor on that project, so I was up to date on that. And, uh, of course, the torch restatement, second, was going on. And then there were these three new projects, the uh, pre-arrangement, oh, uh, 
contracts. Well, that con contractory statement had been begun too, I think. I think that started a year later, 1964, according to your reports, if I read them correctly. You came on in 63. Mm -hmm. I think you had enough to digest with three new projects. Land use, pre-arraignment, and federal, state, and gift tax. Mm -hmm. And uh, I suppose that the success of the model penal code was a significant influence in the council agreeing to do more statutory projects. Well, I think that we certainly persuaded the council that uh, the institute could do the format of the institute was appropriate to uh, the statutory work. And uh, of course, uh, though I myself it was perhaps something of a crusader for law reform by statute uh, rather than the slower process of decisional change, or at least along with the slower process of decisional uh, change. Uh, by that time, there was reasonable, a reasonable degree of acceptance of that point of view. And I think that made it easier to cast the uh, land use project as a, in the legislative form, and to cast the pre-arraignment project in, in legislative form. Well, uh, you, you picked that up in your annual, your first annual report. Uh, uh, you may recall your last paragraph uh, on that in that report in which you say important as the common law remains in our system the most pressing tasks of law increasingly have been assumed by legislation then you go on and say whether we approve it or not we are living in the greatest legislative age in the entire history of man that was a theme that was to recur during your uh, 20 what's the 22 reports as director Well, I'm sure it, uh, it did. Uh, uh, it was uh, it was my basic slant on things uh, in my teaching as well as in institute work, and I think that in uh, my, my happiness about uh, being offered the uh, director post at the Institute uh, was predicated in some part at least on my thought that uh, the Institute could be persuaded to uh, subordinate the restatement emphasis uh, sufficiently uh, to accommodate a uh, reasonable amount of statutory work, which was really proved before I became director by uh, Judge Goodrich's approach to the uh, land use and pre-arrangement uh, questions. Well, he, even, even the tax project. I mean, all three of those were legislative in basic perspective. Uh, you mentioned Goodrich several times. I take it you have a sort of a solid opinion of his contribution as director, as you do, of course, of Dr. Lewis. You had two great predecessors in office, I take it, in your view. Well, uh, uh, I didn't know Mr. Lewis, and uh, from my point of view, the uh, original uh, proposal for the Institute uh, was uh, suffered from this uh, total reliance on case law as the uh, subject matter of Institute work and as the uh, means to improve
improvement of the law of the United States. Uh, difference between uh, uh, Dr. Lewis and Judge Goodrich uh, was precisely there. Uh, Judge Goodrich was, from my point of view, a modern man in his view of law, and uh, uh, Lewis uh, was very much still a Langdellian. Well, you, you, uh, that's a theme you mentioned in your address in, at the annual dinner in 1984, where you spoke about the traditionalists and, which, uh, and the uh, reformationists. Remember that? Yeah. And then the middle group, you put uh, Dr. Lewis, I think, in the middle group, together with Elia Root, and you put uh, Justice Cardoza, Judge Learned Hand, Justice Harlan Stone and Goodrich as the leaders of the Reformation. You know, sometimes it's a, a speech read years later is much more meaningful to the reader <laughs> than when he first hears it. But uh, the what? Well, Justice Stone, you know, he, well, of course, when he was, during the period before he went on the Supreme Court, he was on the Council of the Institute, and he was on the original Council. He was one of the uh, original founders. Uh, he had had the idea from the very beginning that what the Institute should do was to develop the restatements and then propose the enactment of the restatements. Uh, and uh, he was very, uh, uh, not only very sincere, but uh, almost dogmatic in his insistence uh, that this was a way for the Institute to uh, achieve its maximum uh, utility. Well, as you know, uh, uh, the second part of his idea was rejected, and I guess quite uh, soundly uh, rejected by the council. And I rather suspect that at that point uh, his enthusiasm uh, greatly declined. Uh, I, I, the council may have been right that it uh, would have been uh, unwise to seek legislative approval. One thing, it would have been very hard to get. Uh, for another thing, it might have operated to freeze things uh, in, a, in a very way that was antipathetic to the uh, uh, enthusiasts for uh, case law and, the, uh, and case development. Uh, but in any event, uh, uh, my sense for it, after all, I was Stone's law clerk from uh, 32 to 33, the October 32 term, and uh, I had the sense that he had turned a bit cold on the Institute, and I also had the sense that that was the reason why he Stone tended to turn cold on people who rejected any ideas of his. Not unlike some other people, I, a lot of us. <laughs> but but do you think that's where Judge Maris got his idea? You know, Judge Maris had the restatement, I believe, enacted a, statutorily in the Virgin Islands and in Guam. No, I think that was a little different because uh, uh, there, uh, there was no body of case law. Huh? I, I mean, you didn't have a mature body of case law. But I think that he, not even Maris, would have proposed uh, getting the new legislature of New York to enact the uh, restatement of torts or contract. And uh, Cardozo wouldn't have been for it. Well, coming in, and as you did in midstream in 1963, some of the new projects were already crystallized as far as 
Well, you, you, you arranged, I think you, you were instrumental in getting the grants from Ford for land use and pre-arraignment. Well, but, I, uh, it's true uh, that, that I carried forward uh, to consummation the applications that were in for those grants, uh, but don't underestimate the startup that uh, Judge Goodrich had already given that all the preliminary discussions uh, with the Ford people had been conducted by Judge Goodrich. I don't know who else was with him, probably Tweed, uh, at least, and uh, uh, maybe Pfeiffer, or two. Uh, but uh, those applications were in, in and in healthy condition uh, when I succeeded, when he died, and, and when I took over, uh, I, I, uh, I had to pick up from there when the grants were made. But even there, uh, Judge Goodrich had picked uh, Arthur Sutherland as director for the uh, pre arraignment project. And I think the council, I know that the council had already approved that. So that was fed accompli. And also the same thing for the uh, land use project with Charlie Haar, who was then a professor at Harvard. Uh, and uh, the, let's see, what was the third one? Uh, well, uh, Charlie, I, I remember Goodrich interviewing uh, Sutherland, Professor Sutherland, for that project. Uh, he was, the third one was uh, Federal State and Gift Tax with Jim Kasner. Yeah, well, there wasn't any doubt about that because the project had been proposed by Jim Kasner. So I didn't have any initial problem on reporters. Uh, and I inherited that, too, from, uh, from Judge Goodrich, though uh, only one of those three arrangements proved to be stable uh, when the work got underway. That's true, as later reports indicate. Uh, in your 64 report, you again speak about the role of legislation, increasingly increasingly need for a legislative resolution to eliminate the incrustation in a field of law and start afresh, which is a refreshing theme. That, yeah. Uh, well, that that, that, that that was the theme that I deliberately pressed at every opportunity. And, uh, and I think that I did carry the Institute on that. I mean, there was no internal resistance to the statutory projects, but I think that the clue to doing it was not diminishing in any way our interest in uh, restatement work, keeping the restatements alive and going so that the people who were devoted to the restatement method of law improvement uh, found in the Institute as much scope for their uh, uh, ambitions uh, afterwards as they had before. The uh, statutory thing uh, e emerged as an additional uh, rather than as a substitutive uh, mode of approaching uh, law, law reform. Well, I think the uh, the best episode was the bridge you created between statute and case law when we did landlord and tenant. Yes. And I think in that report you spoke of legislation as serving as a basis for developing restatement propositions. Well, you know, that I think was that was innovative too. That was innovative, but it wasn't my innovation. Uh, actually, the, 
the person who had written most about the use of statutes as a uh, uh, as a base for analogical reasoning uh, through the judicial common law method was Harlem Stone. Uh, and if you, if you take a look at his paper at the Harvard celebration in the early 30s, the paper that was, I think was called The Common Law in the United States, it's about 35, 1935 or 1936. I guess it was the uh, 250th uh, anniversary of the, no, I guess it was the tercentenary, the 300th anniversary of the founding of Harvard. Uh, this was a paper delivered at a very strategic time. Uh, it was just about the time of the president's court plan in relation to the Supreme Court of the United States. And uh, it was Felix Frankfurter who engineered uh, getting Stone invited to give this paper rather than, as you would have expected, uh, Chief Justice Hughes. Uh, all of that was uh, quite articulate uh, uh, scheming, uh, which is indicated in the letters and papers that have been uh, that have been published uh, since. But uh, Stone, in that paper, uh, urged consideration in developing the common law of drawing on statutory determinants as the basis for analogies, as well as, uh, of course, giving generous effect to statutes in the fields that they had uh, come to occupy. And that was one of the main uh, tenets of uh, uh, what was reasonably regarded as a progressive view uh, of law, as distinguished from the uh, type of view associated with Professor Beale, uh, a, a, a sort of mechanical uh, view of the case system. Yeah, but uh, I, 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 all of that was in the making when I was a law student and a beginning teacher, and I must say it made the jurisprudential atmosphere in those times a very exciting time. And you brought that to bear in the Institute, I think. Yeah. Both on landlord and tenant, as I recall, on uh, contracts. When right. Uh, Bob Brocker was uh, dealing with some of the sections there that in relation to the, that he based on UCC. That's absolutely right. And uh, Farnsworth, of course, carried that forward. I thought, I found it interesting in your 64 report where uh, section 402A was reopened and you said the reporter and counsel think the section states the scope of liability of sellers of defective products more narrowly than it has been defined by the numerous decisions since the section was presented on the floor. Now you have the reverse of that, I suppose, taking place. That's right. And then that struck an interesting note. Uh, in 65, uh, Herb, uh, uh, well, that's when uh, I think you reported that uh, Professor Vorenberger succeeded uh, Sutherland on a pre-arraignment code. And you uh, pointed out that there, you know, to indicate the scope of the work had increased to 14 reporters, 14 consultants, 17 research assistants, and 100 plus advisors. How'd you keep that circus going? Well, it was quite an arduous uh, 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 undertaking in terms of time and people, but uh, I, I think I can reasonably say at this distance that uh, the directorship of the Institute 
uh, was not really for me a part-time job. Uh, I did my teaching, but I had been teaching for enough years at that time so that I could continue my teaching uh, without having it take much more time than the number of hours in the classroom. And really all my other time went into uh, institute work. Uh, even my schedule was set up so that I had from uh, midday Wednesday through the balance of the week without any academic uh, obligation so I could use uh, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday of every week uh, for advisory or other institute meetings. And I think that uh, at least during the heavy months of our work, uh, I mean, four or five months of the year, uh, Doris and I were on the road a good part of the time. Uh, 65, I think, was the year when the study draft concept came into play in the Jim Kasner Estate and Gift Tax Project. I suppose that was, we spoke about that earlier, yeah. partial response to the resistance that he met in the tax bar with some of his proposals. Well, you know, I really think that the study draft concept was uh, invented uh, to avoid breaking the heart of a very fine friend of the Institute, uh, Mr. Miller. I forget Mr. Miller's first name. Oh, Robert Miller. Robert Miller. Robert Miller was one of the best friends the Institute ever had. He was a bachelor, a tax lawyer, and uh, I think that uh, the notion of combining the state and gift tax at similar rates and uh, eliminating the uh, distinctiveness that uh, required that a, uh, a credit to be earned uh, in each field separately and not combined, uh, I, I, I think it would literally have broken his heart to think that the Institute had uh, taken that, uh, that uh, position. He, uh, he thought that a, uh, a system of rates, uh, a system of rates that we had, uh, with its preference uh, was absolutely essential to a healthy tax system. Well, this gave us a chance to uh, ventilate uh, that idea without uh, anybody being able to say that the Institute had embraced uh, that idea. Because uh, after Mr. Miller's death, the Institute did embrace it. And of course, Congress enacted it. Well, I think Jim Kasner is very proud of the congressional response to some of his ideas that were. Well, and with good reason. Which was the bar then was very antagonistic, at least the tax bar. Ideas that were that seemed way out uh, in left field. Uh, Jim Kasner had a way of uh, bringing people to see as reasonable solutions to admitted problems uh, and uh, another, another illustration of it is the elimination of a uh, tax on uh, interspousal transfers but just those two ideas the uh, merger of the state and gift on the one hand and the uh, free interspousal transfer on the other uh, represent quite uh, massive contributions to uh, aspects of American tax law that 
touch us all. Well, it's interesting that uh, an adventurous quotes reporter like Prosser with 402A and one like Kasner with this tax and this state business, and you with a penal code, ultimately become national influences. Is that the reporter's persona that does it, or is it the reporter working through the Institute? Well, I credit the Institute enormously. Uh, I remember, for example, uh, in relation to the penal code, uh, apparently when uh, uh, Judge Goodrich and, uh, and Harry Tweed and Tim Pfeiffer started talking to me about that, uh, I inferred from what they said that there was a school of thought in the council that preferred uh, going at the criminal law uh, differently, that is, going at it by subsidizing uh, a scholar or a group of scholars to write a treatise on the criminal law. And it was uh, specifically offered to me in the preliminary stages as an alternative. Would you rather, if the Institute uh, were willing to finance it, uh, would you rather undertake to write a treatise that would be published in your name uh, by the Institute? I said no. That uh, my sense for the situation was that since uh, one didn't do these things just to uh, enjoy uh, reading one's favorite author at night, uh, but uh, uh, to try to make an impact on the law, uh, that the Institute uh, was an organ which, as a corporate entity, uh, could be uh, truly influential, and the uh, notion that an individual uh, however wise or able uh, could marshal that degree of influence uh, seemed much more remote. The best examples you could think of were uh, uh, Williston and Wigmore in their respective fields, but even they, I thought, with the enormous influence that uh, Williston on contracts had exerted on courts and that uh, Wigmore uh, Woodmore's evidence that exerted on the courts and the profession, uh, I thought that still uh, to uh, have the imprimatur of the Institute, not merely as a publisher, but as an organization that had done the work and approved it, uh, was a way to get a, a decent result. And uh, I, I added that uh, I thought particularly in the criminal law field, where if it came out with anything that the district attorneys didn't like, uh, they'd simply start propagandizing against the author and destroy the author and destroy the product. They couldn't do that with uh, an organization like the Institute with a kind of representation uh, that uh, it had. Well, I'm absolutely damn sure that I was wrong about that. Well, yet there's a problem today, if we may go to present time. The uh, Tom Rose study of a better way is a, a, well, he had the benefit of a group of advisors, but if it's to be published, it's to be published as his work. It hasn't gone through the Institute. And I take it that that, that is not, not the optimum circumstances. And it's to some extent the compensation project that Dick Stewart is on, the, the tort, uh, temporary tort reform project, presents similar problems. Uh, but on the other hand, when you get a heavy agenda, uh, as we have today, it may not be possible to. Well, my own judgment would be better not to do the work than to farm it out. And uh, but we'll wait and see. In any event, 
at least today, uh, uh, I think the Institute is uh, less, uh, is more secure in its status and influence uh, than it was even 20, 25 years ago. The, uh, and I think that the last 25 years have had something to do with producing that result. That, that raises another question. What, what is the influence, that, that, well, let me put it this way, I've always been amazed at what happens to a draft. It goes through uh, a specialized advisory committee with knowledgeable reporters, and then it comes to the council, who are not necessarily experts in the field, and new ideas come up that have credence. And then it goes back and is revised, and comes to the annual meeting, and the same phenomena happens again. Here, these all knowledgeable reporters and advisors and council have not thought of all the ramifications. Is that a characteristic of the Institute process because there are more numbers reviewing it? How do you explain that phenomenon? Well, I think it has to do, first of all, with the subject matter. I mean, that's the way law is. And uh, uh, the more time you take, the more ideas you're going to have. Uh, and the more uh, uh, that you bring different minds to bear on a problem or on a field, uh, the richer the result is going to be. Uh, it's in the nature of law, I think, it, particularly the, uh, the non-empirical aspects of law. I mean, this is a matter of, uh, you know, in which uh, uh, morality and conscience and principle and uh, all uh, uh, have an important role to uh, role to play, but uh, that thing about the Institute that fascinated me. I never realized until I got involved in Institute work that this, uh, this uh, repetitive uh, examination and re-examination uh, of a problem and its proposed solutions uh, seems to pay off the longer you carry it on. Uh, and you really stop when you do, not because uh, you don't think that uh, further rumination would be rewarding, uh, but just as a practical matter to, uh, because the world has to go on. And that reminds me of Goodrich's famous quip about writing opinions. He said, God made the world the six days, and on the seventh day he rested, and it shouldn't take any longer to write an opinion. Well, it's, a, it's the same point, and uh, uh, I think the difference is there was one difference, maybe. Uh, normally, an opinion gets revised by a judge and a law clerk or two, uh, in the Institute, as in legislative work generally, uh, you bring many more voices, uh, eyes to bear and voices to speak uh, before you come to a, uh, to rest. I, I think that uh, this is what has made the Institute's product better than the product of other organizations that work simply with a subcommittee uh, uh, reaching an agreement or a majority agreement on a formulation or a draft or a report and then bringing it to a huge body uh, on a motion uh, to approve it uh, where all the, uh, the, the uh, uh, forces at play uh, really argue against amendments on the floor. But in the Institute, everything is always open until it, until the end. It, it's expensive and laborious, but it, in the end it's... But it's expensive and laborious, but you can bet your bottom dollar that if the Institute has 
a good reputation as I believe it has and commands substantial influence as I believe it does, it is that method, that ponderous method, on the one hand, coupled with the choice of personnel on the basis of talent on the other, uh, that explains it all. I think you put your finger on some important things there. Your 66 report is the one, I believe, that spoke about the formula for restating, what restating the law yes. means. And you did it in the introduction on pages 5, 6, 7, it goes on to page 5, 9. And uh, it's an eloquent statement that somehow should be in the almost printed on the front of every report so that when the draft comes up for consideration, the, the old hackneyed question that is, is it raised of, is that restating the law? Right. I um, like that. Uh, <laughs> I say I like that. I, like that. Well, I think we get less of it now, though. Well, you, you read the white papers and refer to the business roundtable people. But they're not institute people. No, but... We used to get it, though, within the Institute. Now I don't believe we get it within the Institute. We get it with people outside the Institute. Uh, like, the, uh, like the people I was writing about in the 1966 report. Uh, you remember what it was. We had uh, uh, two people. Fred Helms and somebody and Fred Helms, yeah. Somebody else who had joined together to denounce uh, the Institute's treatment of product liability, the that is the support of strict liability in the uh, product damage field. Uh, and the basis of the attack was that at the time when the Institute adopted, what was it, 409A? 402A. 402A, right, of the Torts Restatement, it was a minority view. And it wasn't, if, 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 if that meant, as I think it did with them, that the number of courts that had decided cases that way was less than, uh, uh, 24, I guess we had 48 states then, uh, or 25 states, that they were right. But what process saw was that the law was moving that way. That is, that as these cases were coming up, uh, jurisdictions in which that had not been held were holding that. And the Institute uh, agreed with him that that was the direction uh, that the law was taking, and then uh, 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 approved the formulation of 402A. Well, uh, uh, Helms and his colleague were right that this undoubtedly uh, uh, involved some bootstrapping. Uh, once. Uh, the Institute had approved 402A, it became easier to get another jurisdiction to, uh, that had not yet taken that position to take it. And so very speedily after 402A, the number of jurisdictions that were in accord with that formulation increased to the point uh, where then it, it, it did command. Uh, a majority. Now, their criticism was not that the result in 402A was wrong in the sense that it was undesirable, uh, but that the Institute had approved it at a time when it would, did not have the support of a majority of the states. Three or four well, process that. Well, we had never taken the position that uh, uh, what the Institute would approve uh, was to be determined by what a majority of the state courts 
or common law courts had held. Uh, as Judge Good Goodrich put it in a in a uh, report of his uh, statement that I quoted, uh, so long as there was a disagreement among uh, courts as to what the common law was, uh, we felt free to adopt the position that we thought was right. Or to, uh, he said. We felt free to adopt uh, uh, either position, and naturally we chose the one that we thought was right. That quote. Uh, and uh, that had been the, the, if there was any point at which a creative moment existed on this issue, it was right there when Judge Goodrich said that. Uh, Though I think you'll find intimations of that in uh, in William Draper Lewis's piece that we published with the restatements, the, 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 the paper that he called "How We Did It." Uh, he he too, I think, escaped any uh, saved the institute from any. The idea that we were committed to articulating a majority view, uh, making a count of heads. But still, uh, uh, Dr. Lewis was very strong for the proposition that we were stating the law that is, not the law that ought to be, but the law that is. And uh, Judge Goodrich was a little too cagey to uh, do it, put it quite that way, he knew that, uh, uh, that the, the, the mode of existence of law uh, is a very complicated idea rather than a, uh, a simple idea. And, uh, uh, you know, Holmes put it in terms of prediction of decisions, but after all, that doesn't help a court. Uh, court doesn't decide cases by predicting how it will decide cases. So the normative element, the uh, notion that this not only is the law but ought to be the law, or not only ought to be the law but is the law, uh, is a somewhat mysterious but nonetheless very important aspect of our concept of what law is. And that complexity was what I tried to articulate in the, in the report. E even then, it's somewhat enigmatic in the articulation. It has to be. It, it's an enigmatic problem. But, uh, uh, but I think that I did carry the counsel on that. Uh, Helms and his institute filed a brief against me and the council considered that brief and uh, rejected it. And I never, I never lost out in the council on the proposition that we didn't have adequate support for an assertion that the law was such and such. In, in your report the following year, you, you refer to the previous statement, and you say of it in the last sentence, the statement of the principle has not, at least as yet, provoked dissent. Yes. So uh, it carried the day. I think the judges were happy with it. It really reflected their own view of uh, how they wanted it to be. And not that they are not, uh, that, that I would for a moment contend that judges aren't influenced by prior decisions or any more than that they're not influenced by statutory language. But they know that the system requires a certain degree of flexibility and elbow room. Well, you, you put it again eloquently. My purpose is to ask if we are not obliged in their own de deliberations to weigh all of the considerations relevant to the development of the common law 
that our polity calls on the courts to weigh in theirs. Right. That, that, is, that is the position I would die for. <laughs> well, uh, we're making some progress here. I'm now up to 67 in the reports. <laughs> and I notice that that's when the Article 9 Review Committee uh, got underway. Uh, Bob Brocker, of course, was quite a reporter for contracts before he died. And I think he also uh, carried the laboring oar in the Article 9 Review Committee. That's right. Uh, he was quite a remarkable man. Remember, he uh, was also a very good judge. Another uh, one of your, I think, significant contributions, I think you said, must have said it was inspired by Paul Freund, was the reformulation of the concept of illustrations. Yes. It came up in connection with the restatement of conflict of laws. Right. Where it was not, didn't have to be a yes or no answer. Right. Uh, as you said, it focused on the issues of factors to be weighed. I think that made a pretty significant change. It's still not universally followed in our restatements. No, uh, and of course, uh, there are differences among fields of law and how concrete and specific uh, one can be as to what the right answer is and the kind of situation that you tend to put as a hypothetical and a, uh, in, in, in an illustration. But, but uh, I was always content if reporters uh, had it in mind that this alternative mode of approach to illustrations was acceptable, was available, that they could use it. And some reporters used it more than others. In judgments, for example, it was used very effectively and very frequently. In foreign relations, it was used. First or second? Most particularly, I think, second. I mean, third, really. Third, third. Right. Revised foreign relations. Now, another highlight, I think, of your reign was the 68 when it was decided to publish Kasner's study on the state and gift taxes. Remember, two parts, a series of recommendations, and then giving the reporter more elbow room, elbow room in his reporter's study uh, to expand on some of the ideas that tax were at that time wouldn't buy, I take it. But well, again, it was, uh, uh, we spoke of Mr. Miller earlier, it was, uh, it was a matter of not pushing the Institute too hard uh, on issues that you found difficult to resolve. Uh, so and yet not losing the benefit of the ideas and the analysis uh, that had been uh, articulated by the reporter. And I think that the, uh, I wouldn't like to see it used too often, but uh, when the situation is right for it, I think the study draft is a good solution. Well, something else uh, was you allude to in your, uh, I think it's, uh, now we're up to uh, 68, and that is the um, impact on uh, our work of Supreme Court decisions that have consti uh, that, that impose constitutional dimensions. This came out in connection with the pre-arraignment project. Mm -hmm you may recall, and then subsequently, of course, in torts and elsewhere. Uh, that wasn't so true in the early days, was it, uh, of uh, institute work, that uh, uh, restatement work and even in statutory work where the impact of new decisions of the court? Uh, well, if the decision goes to power, 
uh, the Supreme Court decision goes to power. After all, it's the first principle of our uh, polity that uh, it's binding uh, on all inferior courts and uh, wouldn't make much sense to be restating as law uh, the, a proposition that was inconsistent with a flat holding of the United States Supreme Court unless you were prepared to predict that the Supreme Court would not follow uh, that decision uh, if the matter were to come up again, uh, if you were prepared to make that prediction, uh, I don't see any reason why uh, the general principle that the Institute follows wouldn't be, wouldn't be acceptable. It would have to be accompanied by full disclosure, of course, that an overruling by the Supreme Court was, uh, was necessary. Well, in the pre-arraignment project, came up in terms of the Miranda case. And uh, wasn't there some question of whether the project should continue in light of that Miranda? Or didn't it go that far? No. Uh, the, 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 uh, the issue was whether the Institute should take a position on the question then before the Supreme Court in Miranda against Arizona. Uh, John Frank, who had either argued or briefed the uh, Miranda case in the Supreme Court, made a very strong plea that the Institute not undercut him uh, by uh, taking a position antipathetic to his submission in the Miranda case, but uh, the case had not yet been decided. Uh, I think that what we did, or what the Institute did, was to yield to John's uh, plea and not to take a position on the issue that first time around. Now, the second time around, when it had been decided, and decided contrary to what the Institute probably would have approved, uh, then it came up as to whether the Institute would approve a, uh, a recommendation or a statement inconsistent with a recent Supreme Court decision, and the judgment was that we shouldn't do that. But that seems to be happening increasingly. You're thinking of torts and the defamation uh, part that when Wade was reporter, there, there were a well, constant we, interplay between... Well, we held off while the Supreme Court was feeling its way in, in libel, for example, we held off to the last minute, and even then uh, took pains to look at the current, uh, still current, uh, Torts Restatement. We took pains to show that uh, uh, the Supreme Court had not uh, taken a contrary position on anything that was stated in Torts Restatement Second. The same thing seems to happen in the foreign relations law, both first and second. Second and third with pending cases that, that held up the... You know, the active state... Active state. ...case held up the first free statement. And then I forget what it was in the revised free statement. Uh, but that makes sense. Uh, if you're dealing with a federal question, which can be authoritatively determined finally only by one court. The notion of picking and choosing among decisions 
<laughs> that go different ways uh, it doesn't make any sense and the institute has never to my knowledge pushed it to beyond where it makes sense but wouldn't the institute have an institute position have an influence on, on a court decision <coughs> absent justice douglas to whom you refer in your close address oh the institute has often uh, had an influence in fact, it might help the court. Well, uh, that, that, if, if we thought that that would be so, and if the Institute disagreed with uh, a current Supreme Court decision, there's nothing in our procedure that would preclude doing what I think we would do. We would state the Supreme Court decision result as a law, but we would use the comments or the reporter's notes to marshal the arguments against it. I mean, in favor of a different, uh, a different view. Now, the first, the original restatement format wouldn't have allowed that. And one of the great contributions that Judge Goodrich made uh, in restatement second was to uh, modify that format so that the Institute could do that. I'm not saying that it's something you do lightly, but, but it still could be done. And I dare say it has been done. Yeah.